This morning's scripture reading comes from the book of Ephesians, five, uh, verse, chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. And this is a letter that was written to the church at Ephesus by the Apostle Paul. It was intended to be read in a setting such as this. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Husbands, Go all out in your love for your wives exactly as Christ did for the church, a love marked not by giving, uh, marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring out the best of her, dressing her in a dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor since they've already, they're already one in marriage. No one abuses his own body, does he? No, he feeds and pampers it. That's how Christ treats us, the church. Since we are part of his body, And this is why a man leaves father and mother and cherishes his wife. No longer two, they become one flesh. This is a huge mystery, and I don't pretend to understand all of it. What is clearest to me is the way Christ treats the church. And and this provides a good picture of how each husband is to treat his wife, loving himself in loving her, and how each wife is to honor her husband. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Don. God bless you. Let us pray. Father, we gather under the name of Jesus. And we ask, Lord, that in doing so, you would give us the gift of your Spirit, which is promised. We pray, Father, that we would gather as your kids, as your children. We would cuddle up next to you, Lord, and you would speak a word to us. You're a good Father, and we love you for simply who you are. We want to know you better. We want to know what you have for us to do better. And so we pray that you would pour gifts into your church right now. We pray that you would pour into me the gift of preaching by the Holy Spirit. And that you would pour into the hearts of every member of our church, of our fellowship this morning, whoever's here, a deep desire for you, for your kingdom, and for the life you're creating for us today. We love you, Father. We pray this prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I stood before you half awake last week, about 36 after, hours after a baby was born, and um, I've gained a little bit more sleep since then, but not much more. And as I stood before you, God put on my heart to carve out some time for three Sundays, this is the second of three, to talk about a vision that God has been uh, harassing me with most of the summer. It's included anxiety and concern, uh, excitement, and in the end, it's included a strong passion to trust God and what God is up to. As I mentioned last week, I believe our country is on the cusp, and hopefully the whole world is on the edge of a new revival. 
And I don't mean a church program or we need to put up tents and do a big crusade preaching sermon series. I mean a revival where God is the one doing the work. And the church is the one witnessing for God. I believe this is a great time for a a revival, particularly in our country. When people are becoming more and more upset, concerned, disjointed, ununified. And I believe that the revival will occur primarily in households, in your home. It will include the church. We will experience things of God together. It will include denominations. It will include uh, major events. But the most important foothold, the greatest venue for this revival of God will be in the homes of the people who love the name Jesus. It's important to say that because for a long time we've normalized that you can say the name Jesus, you can be a Christian household and attend church, and then go home and beat your wife. Or have a girl on the side. That was what we call the silent generation, my grandparents' generation, where we didn't talk about such things. But they happen. And then the baby boomers, I'm sure there's no baby boomers in this room today. The baby boomers generation was known for taking what was done in secret and doing it overtly and openly. Here I am, deal with it. We peacocked it out. We made it wild. And we lived into openly the same problem that you could be a Christian household by name and yet not transformed by the Holy Spirit at home. And I believe this generation, my generation, that's coming up with great numbers, could be in our nation the greatest fatherless generation of our country's history. And God loves a good story. God loves the valley of the dry bones. He loves a good narrative where things are not looking great, where things have been normalized, where we have accommodated for living in ways that just aren't glorifying to God, where we have begun to believe and normalize believing that you can be a Christian who has a worldview about God and yet never have an expectation that God, the living God, would actually ever show up and bless your marriage. The last person most people expect to show up is God. We expect Oprah to show up, a new book at Barnes & Noble, a fancy article on Facebook that we'll share with everybody, a new political opinion. We'll, we'll, We'll scour the earth looking for new gimmicks and ideas to apply to our lives. But the last person, even the church, who expects to show up is God. And the good news is, is that God has declared a revival. God has declared a burning desire in the hearts of countless families to this day that's growing, that's starting to trust and believe that God has the power to show up. And when God grows that hunger, it's not the church that feeds that hunger, it's God, the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. And so the good news about a revival, a true revival, is it's not our determination or hard work or resolution or difficult choices. It's trusting that this is the year of God's favor for our marriages. This is the year of God's favor for our church. This is the year of God's favor for our children. This is the year of God's favor for Him to show up in a mighty way in your vocation, maybe at school, at home, wherever. That's what a revival is. And that's what I'm here to preach Because the revival, I believe, will take place primarily in the home, that means the church needs to be second. No longer should we judge people's Christian walks by whether or not they attend church on Sunday. Now please, you'll hurt my feelings if you don't attend church on Sunday. I'll have to write in my disappointment journal, you know. But the church needs to get behind what God's doing. We'll spend more time on that later, but we're really good at meetings expecting a lot of involvement in committee structures and difficult times and hardships in such a way that church can actually become a detriment to what God's actually doing in someone's life. 
So it's important that even me as the preacher needs to listen. What is God doing in the Stevens' home? What is God doing in the Graham's home? In Troyce's home? How can I as pastor, how can we as church cheer someone on as God is doing his work in their home, in their, home, in their marriages? When I first started here, I mentioned um, that it would be kind of cool if, if God moved and, and 30 or 40 households decided to go on retreat one weekend. Of course, we have the camping event. And I kind of threw this out there, and I had several people say, oh, that would be horrible. <laughs> what? Why would that be horrible? Because if they're all out of town and a few pastors are out of town, then who's going to be seated in our pews on Sunday? And subconsciously you look up and the greatest goal we have is to fill a room with people for one hour, one day a week. We can do that. We're doing it. But the revival of God is not about what we want. It's about what he's able to do. It's his glory in your home. It's his change in your life. That, as your, as your pastor, is what I'm going to be leading us toward and encouraging that the church is second. That what God's doing in your household is number one. And we'll do it together. Now this morning, I felt called to spend a specific sermon on uh, the place of marriage in this revival. And it's a touchy subject. Marriage is not uh, everyone's calling. Uh, obviously, a single life is a blessed life. Jesus is probably the prime example of that. There's many ministries. You, you can read in the New Testament about the, the joy and the blessedness and the, the power of living a competent, Holy Spirit, single life. And several of us have had difficulties in marriage, and it's been a, a, a touchy subject. And many of us in this room are experiencing marriage with memory, looking back with great, great gratitude for our spouse who's gone on to the eternal kingdom. But wherever you are with marriage this morning... We can all agree that it plays a vital role in a community, especially in a church, and especially in the homes of those who are called to marriage. And so this morning I wanted to spend a little time on what revival in marriage would look like. Now before I say anything, this is not a self-help book or a marriage retreat where we're going to go and learn the top ten ways to talk to your spouse. I feel like this when you say that. No, we're not going to do that. You can do that. That's fine. <laughs> and husbands, don't worry. This is not a ripping off the band-aid so your wife can come home and say, let's talk about our marriage. You know, No, I'm here to shine a light on what God can do when God declares revival in your marriage. And it's based on what the Scripture teaches. Marriage... Marriage is primarily a relationship that's a holy calling between two people that assists, in the, and here's the churchy word, that assists with your sanctification. Now, sanctification is what we talked about a few weeks ago. It's the opposite of being stuck in life. Sanctification is the churchy word for maturing in your faith, for becoming more Christ-like every day for growing as a child of God, for being filled more with the Holy Spirit and glorifying God more, bearing more of His image by being filled with more of His Spirit. The process of sanctification is the process of maturing. We mentioned a few weeks ago that one of the crises, like in our homes, is you can be a Christian by name and you've been stuck for 50 years and we've normalized that. Revival is to change that. And when revival enters your marriage, your marriage becomes a sanctifying relationship, which means that God uses that relationship to make you look more like Him. He uses that relationship to glorify Himself more in your life. I'm sorry to inform you that marriage does not boil down to our happiness. Marriage does not boil down to procreation. Marriage does not boil down to survival. Two are better than one. Marriage boils down to a holy calling where God can be at work in, in a specific way to draw you to closer communion with Him. 
If marriage is for sanctification, for growing in our maturity in Christ, what that means is that the best way to measure a marriage is not necessarily how long we've been married, but across that time, how much has our marriage helped us grow in our communion with the Father? I can go to Texas Tech for 15 years and never learn anything. It's not about how long you've been somewhere. It's about what happened when you were there. Marriage as a sacrament. The Catholic Church calls it, it's a sacrament of the church like baptism with Luke. It's used by God for God's glory to be honored and revered by all. Marriage in the church is called holy matrimony. When God enters a revival into the marriages of this country and into his holy church, what this means is we begin all of a sudden experiencing closeness with God because we're married to our spouse. And if marriage is not part of our life, we're grateful for marriage because if you're single, God has not called you to that. God's able to sanctify you without marriage. You're busy encouraging other people to be married well. You could consider, as St. Paul teaches, some things like this, like marriage a crutch. Paul says, I don't need it. If you're called to it, use it. And if you're not called to it, encourage its work in others' lives. Now, the way it boils down according to Scripture, you can pre preach for 10 weeks on the topic of marriage, but the way it was intended was when a wife encounters her husband, when a wife comes into contact with her husband, her experience ought to be cherishing God fills the Holy Spirit into her husband and into that relationship. And nine times out of ten, when that woman, now there can be some bad days, I get that, but when that wife is in contact with her husband, she feels like her, she's got a bank account that it's called cherishing. That increases. In Scripture, in Greek, the word cherishing means to warm up. It's actually to heat up, but that could be said the wrong way. You know what I mean? Cherish your wives. Because in marriage, when God is at work... Uh, sanctifying and calling her closer to communion with God, the husband is authorized to be like a, an elephant gun with cherishing his wife. Like, what we say goes twice as far. Husbands, you have to know that you have the power to hurt your wife more than anyone else. And you have the power to cherish your wife more than anyone else. When the Holy Spirit's at work, it magnifies that cherishing Scripture teaches one thing to women, it teaches about 12 things to guys, and it sums up in that word, cherish your wife as Christ does the church. Every encounter, every word, cherish. And women are called, women are called in marriage to admire our husbands. That's kind of weird I said it that way. Your husbands. Admire your husbands. That whenever I'm around my wife, my account of admiration increases. I feel encouraged because life takes courage. And the cycle of sanctification looks like this. The more I'm admired, the more I cherish. And the more I cherish, the more she admires. See how this goes? But the current crisis of marriage, even Christian marriages, is that we don't cherish our wives and we don't admire our husbands and it's getting worse. And so we measure marriage, mar marriage by how long we've been married. Not how, how openly have I been cherishing my wife and how admired do I feel by my wife. And if you look up down the road and this cycle continues, which is the great crisis of marriage, right now secular marriage statistically looks no different than Christian marriage. The cycle continues down, 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 down. And one day you're sitting on the couch and you hear the worst sound in your life. The garage door opening because your spouse has just come home. Because every time you're around your spouse, you feel uncherished, or every time you're around your spouse, you feel unadmired, you want to go out with your butts. You want to go to your church, because at least at church you're somebody, but at home you're nobody. This is the crisis. This is the valley of the dry bones. This is what's become normal. Marriage based on tolerating, as opposed to sanctifying. 
God had me stand up and preach the beginning of this topic next week, assuming that he's already been at work in several people's hearts, several households' heart, hearts, raising this expectation, this hunger to have God's glory be at work in their homes. Several young men have come to me. We've been meeting in a group once a month and, and talking, and this topic of cherishing came up, and, and we, we were like, oh, man, we... That's what we're supposed to be doing. I don't even know. That word doesn't mean anything to me. I haven't cherished a thing until I was married. So we started to pray and learn from each other. And we discerned the greatest power of cherishing our wives. We're just going to swing for the fences. We're going to go for a million dollars right now. The greatest way we can cherish our wives is to go home right now, stand behind her, put hands on her shoulders, and pray to the Father with her. Pray to God with her. I brought this topic up with a few of my pastor friends and they all confess that they never pray with their wives. These are pastors. The last person they feel comfortable praying with is their spouse. Sound familiar? If you're praying for your spouse every day in an intimate way with the Father, consider yourself abnormal in a good way. We've normalized the spiral, the callous, the lack of trust, We've normalized not admiring our husbands. We've normalized not cherishing our wives. And that way, when you introduce the topic of marriage, either someone becomes legalistic and starts pointing a finger, or someone becomes overly liberal and say, well, Paul doesn't know what he's talking about in the Bible. St. Paul just hates women. Either way, just drop all that stuff. That stuff will not lead you into the righteousness of the Father. The Holy Spirit has declared over our homes His ability to come into your life So that if there was a statistic for divorce as opposed to 50% with Christian marriages, if there was a statistic for sanctified marriages, marriages of the Holy Spirit, we might recognize that's more like 2% in a divorce. Now we were in staff meeting this week and we were going through the scripture reading and in our staff there's been divorce and, and troubles and things like that. So this was a really cool conversation And when you define marriage as something God establishes for the inworking of the Holy Spirit, one of our staff members pointed out that when they went through a divorce, they were so ashamed because they heard Malachi 6 say that God hates divorce, or what Jesus says in Mark 9 says, what what, uh, God has put together, let no man put asunder. And so they felt guilty. They thought, maybe, maybe I'm not even going to be able to work here as a, as a pastor. I'm not even, because I, I got a divorce and da, 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 going all this stuff. And when they heard, without even me saying it, when they heard the words that marriage that God loves is the marriage that God is at work in, they've started to realize that when their marriage ended in, in divorce, as difficult as that was and as hard as that was, as, as, as much love as he still has for his ex-wife, as hard as that was, it's not that God hates that. God hates it when two people are anointed in the Spirit and are growing in faith and are maturing and then one of them suddenly dies. God hates it when two people are having a Holy Spirit marriage and they're dwelling up and they're moving and maturing in faith and one of them at a moment of weakness is seduced by Satan and has an affair and then the marriage ends. What God has joined together let no man put us under. Not what the state of Texas has put together, not because you stood in a chapel and stood before a preacher and said some words, but if God has been at work in your marriage, if God has been the one driving your marriage, driving your cherishing of your wife, your admiring of your husband, if God has been the one at work in that, and then that ends, yes, God does not like that. Friends, whether marriage has been part of your past or you're in a marriage right now and you're seeking something deeper, It's not out on the streets. It's definitely not with another person. If you don't know what sanctified marriage is today, you won't know it with another relationship. It's not out there, it's not in here, it's not over there. It's with God alone. With Christ alone. And your marriage, again, is not about your happiness, a procreation or anything like that. It's about God seeking to glorify himself in your home pulling his likeness out of you. Marriage is a mystery. It was in the garden before language, any form of government. Jesus dwelled in marriages and blessed them and the Holy Spirit is the one that sustains them. 
And friends, if you are in a marriage and God is getting his hands on it right now, can you feel that? The choir, I, we didn't even line this up. We're about to do a revowing for camera. This was not on the docket. All these things came. The choir saying what? Ruth 1, 16 and 17. Guys, that's written on the inside of my wedding ring. I better not take that off. That'd be a bad sign. It's in here. Where you go, I will go. See, God's lining these things up. If marriage is part of your life, just know that it's not to be upside down. It's no longer you and your love and your energy that's keeping your marriage going. It's the power of your marriage that's going to keep your love going. It's the power of God that's going to, it's like the power of the baptism is going to keep your walk going, not your perfection. Church, let God have access. He's knocking right now. Open that door. Pray, talk with your spouse. Listen to that burning within yourself. And start cherishing and admiring. Hold your spouse's hand like, a, like you're on the dock, jumping into a lake. And don't one of you jump and the other one laugh. At the count of three, jump. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray a blessing over the gift of the specific covenants you establish for growing your people into your likeness. We thank you for baptism. We thank you for what Luke has gone through to grow in obedience to you, to know your voice better, and to have the adventure of letting you turn the pages of his story. And Father, we praise you for the gift of two baptized believers coming together in marriage, that you would call them together to grow and mature. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray for the spark of revival to continue, Lord, in the marriages in this room that are solid and spirit-filled. And we pray, Lord, for a new thing to begin, that this would be a new day for the marriages in our fellowship that are suffering. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray you would exercise your dominion. We pray, Father, for the revival to take place in our household, that it would change this world, and that your name would be known very strongly in this country, not as an idea or a philosophy, but as a power, a truth, a life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.